All right. Uh, if you want, it might be fascinating for you to keep a finger uh, over on 2 Thessalonians 2.4. And that's what was in the scripture reading, because that's the guy that I believe, I think that's going to help describe part of what I'm going to say. All right, so my mom got on my case the other day. She said, I just hate it when preachers mention something, then they don't explain it. It will help explain things if you keep an eye over there on Thessalonians. If you want, read it over and over. I don't mind you not paying attention to me if you're reading Scripture, okay? That's fine. Sleeping, no. All right. This is Jesus, and the... What is a good way to begin this? This is so staggering. There are different aspects of this. I'll just jump ahead to stuff because I can't take a, a lot of time for this. Is what, what happens here is this event of the uh, abomination of desolation. I come from a school of thought that holds specifically that this is talking about a future event and was foreshadowed slightly in the destruction of the temple. So in 70 AD, we got a little taste of it. We got a little taste of it back there with Antiochus Epiphanes. And it seems that none of those events perfectly fit. It really sounds like there's a future guy who's the ultimate culmination of all these things. And if you've never studied anything like this, the best way I can put it across to you is imagine the ultimate Hitler. That's the best way I know how to put it across. The ultimate ego uh, wants to be God and isn't going to let you not worship him. Okay? It's the ultimate human ego. And so most scholars believe that what we're talking about here in this abomination of desolation takes place in a time period called the Tribulation, which is a seven-year period. And over there in Daniel that you read out of, it talks about weeks or and a week and stuff like that. It's probably referring to a week of years, seven years. And this appears that there is two sections to this. There is the Tribulation and then there's the Great Tribulation that appears to, to kick in at this event that that is the sign of the great tribulation where mass persecution of those who believe in Christ starts taking place and people are being forced to show their allegiance to the Antichrist or not. And the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, the little horn of Daniel, for me, these are all interchangeable terms. Okay? So, and I will say this. There are different beliefs about an event called the... Rapture. Okay, anybody heard of the rapture? All right. Does anyone remember the 70s and the early 80s with Hal, uh, is it Hal Lindsey, the late great planet Earth? Really uh, popularized a lot of this stuff in the, uh, among culture. The idea that there is an event where people are, who are Christians are caught up together in the cloud <coughs> to meet Jesus in the air question is, and that seems to be clearly in Scripture, Paul talks about it. Paul's the only one who really specifically talks about it, it looks like. He talks about this being caught up together in the air. Now, Jesus also talks about angels gathering saints from the four corners of the earth and stuff like that. It seems like they're talking about the same thing. There are those who believe that this event takes place at the beginning of the tribulation. That would be called pre-trib or pre-tribulation rapture theory. There's those who believe it's mid-trib, that it starts right before this, about three, year, three and a half years in. And there are those who hold that it's at the end. Basically, at the return of Christ, the saints are, dead saints are resurrected, living saints are immediately translated into a glorified state to be with Christ as him and his armies from Revelation chapter 19 are returning to take care of final business, okay? I come from the post-trib position, okay? I believe that the church actually does go through the entire tribulation. A lot of people disagree with me, okay? 
So I just let you know that mine's not the only form of thought on this thing, okay? But I will say this. Mine is the oldest form of thought on this. The early church believed that the catching up, uh, and I'm talking like first and second century, they believed that these things were all one and the same event, okay? Now, church history does not determine what is truth. Scripture determines what is truth. But I am saying this, that it does have a long heritage to it. Okay, so I'm saying I'm not some crazy who's just coming out of left field. There are, there's some thought behind it. Okay, so let's get into this. Verse 15, and we're going to go to verse 22, I believe. Uh, when you see the abomination that of desolation which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. When it says, let the reader understand, what that means is that a good Jew would investigate the scriptures on this, and that would normally mean that you need to reference, maybe go visit your rabbi or your preacher or something like that, and say, what in the world is this talking about? And a good Jew would immediately say, well, that's talking about over there in Daniel chapter 9, the abomination that causes desolation. And we already saw that Antiochus Epiphanes did all this stuff. Well, now it's long after Antiochus Epiphanes, and now Jesus is warning about an other abomination of desolation. So you would put the two together and go, oh, well, that already happened. So was Jesus prophesying it? Well, two and two make four. Jesus is saying something like that is going to happen again. Okay? So the question among a lot of scholars is, did this happen in A.D. 70 when the temple was destroyed? Was it fulfilled specifically there or... Is there something even further? Okay? So, uh, I want you to see this. <clears throat> then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. All right? That appears to me, specifically talking about Judea, that there at least must be a part of this that's referencing A.D. 70. All right? Now, whether that's the whole thing, that's what I'm going to discuss. But at least part of this must be talking about, because it's, it's so localized in its language. Those who are where? Not in Washington, D.C. or wherever. It says in Judea specifically. Okay? This is how I take this. That that is talking about back there around 70 A.D. Or really it would be just before all that stuff kicked in. But here's the problem in setting it all back there in 70 A.D. AD. Here's the big problem. Because it's saying, when you see the abomination that makes desolate, okay, that's when you're supposed to flee, right? That would have been too late in 70 AD. That would have been way too late. Because what ended the entire tribulation type thing that was going on in, in uh, Jerusalem, what, that event, and this is what it is, uh, when the Romans came in and they finally destroyed the entire temple, what they did that seems to be a type of abomination of desolation there is that they rose up the Roman standard there in the middle of where the Holy of Holies would have been after they destroyed everything. And that was their statement to the Jews. It's like us planting our flag on the moon. They're saying, no more Yahweh. Caesar alone. Well, that's a lot like Antiochus Epiphanes setting up the statue to Jupiter there in, at the altar. Okay? So, and those standards were considered, the, 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 the uh, Roman standards were considered idols by the Jews. They were graven images. And the Romans knew what they were doing when they came in and claimed it for the genius of Caesar, whom they believe is a god. Caesar Augustus' very name, his original name was Octavian. He changed his name to Augusta, uh, Augustus, which has the implication of being a god-man. So do you see how I would say at least part of this must be related to that destruction in 70 A.D.? But the problem that I said again was that that was the very last event of that battle, of those years leading up to that. 
It was over when they finally did that. That would have been way too late to flee to the mountains. Do you see what I'm saying? So if we're going to be very detailed, and the reason I interpret Scripture very tightly, very literally, is that's because that's the way all of the prophecies of Jesus' first coming came to fulfillment. They were all very detailed and very literal. So it would make sense that I should apply that same literal interpretation to the prophecies of his second coming. Because I see the pattern that was always fulfilled. Okay. This appears to mean, and this really did happen. There were prophets, Christian prophets that were recorded in church history at that time who did warn when the Roman army started coming towards Jerusalem, they did warn the Christians that they must flee. And they really did, based upon the prophecies of these early Christian prophets, they really did, did flee on a path to a place called Pella. And most of the Christians in Jerusalem were not caught up in the craziness. They really did escape due to a prophecy that seems to have been rooted in this, flee to the mountains. But if we're going to be very strict in our interpretation, it would have been too late if you wait, because the thing here that is the trigger. Run, 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 run as fast as you can. Get out, get out, get out. The thing that triggers that running in this passage is when the abomination of desolation takes place. That would have been way too late in 70 AD. You would have been caught up in Jerusalem. You would have been in the siege. You would have been starving inside of the city. Persians would have been gutting your guts because there was a suspicion that they thought the Jews were swallowing their gold. And when you came out to give yourself up to the Romans, the Jews stopped doing that because the rumor spread around that was true that the Persian soldiers who were sent to escort you back to the Romans, the Persian soldiers were a little meaner than the Roman soldiers. Uh, the Romans wouldn't have considered them civilized. The Persians were pretty wild. And they would take you off, oh, yeah, brother, let's, it, we're, yeah, we're going to get you some dinner. We know you've been in that siege for a long time. They'd take you around the back, gut you, and look through your guts looking for money. Those Jews never made it. Most of them inside the city never made it. It was a horrible time. That's why it's looked at as a type of end time for the Jews. But then it goes ahead and describes the severity of the nature, and it says this, Whoever is on the housetop must not come down to get the things out of his house that are his. This is what that means. The Jews, they actually used the house. They had a flat top to their house, and it was a real usable thing. You know, they didn't have sloped roofs. They would go up there, and a lot of Jews, it was customary for them to spend their prayer time up there. There are basically two prayer places for these Jews in Palestine. They literally had the closet that Jesus talked about. A lot of these houses had windows everywhere, except for like this center type room that was totally closed off. I would assume that was for preserving things. I don't know, probably cooler in there and stuff like that. And the other place where they would spend their prayer time, and we see Peter did it when he saw the sheet come down from heaven with all the food where God said, take and eat, which obviously means it's okay to eat animals. So. All right, hunters love that passage. So what happens here is he's saying, if you are most likely, even in your meditation time, and you hear about this, any word of this gets to you, the danger is so intense, you don't have one minute to go in the house. This is what today we'd say, your house is on fire. When your house is on fire, do firemen say, yeah, go in and grab a couple of photo albums and make sure that you grab the PlayStation and your widescreen TV? For me, they'd say, uh, yeah, make sure that you grab your guitar and your amplifier because I know that you don't want those to be lost. It's like, no. They say, do not think like that. You will die if you start thinking like that, that I can get one more thing. That's how bad and abrupt the nature of the danger is. If you've got to be out running in minutes, because what they had is from their roof, they had a stair that went out on the side of the house so they could run back in real quick. It didn't go down in it. It was around the side of the house. And they said, no, the idea is you run down the stairs. You can either turn that way or this way. You can either go in the house 
or run. It's saying, when you get to the bottom of those stairs, don't you dare turn this way. You don't have time. What Jesus is trying to show you here is the magnitude of the abruptness of the horror that will take place when the Antichrist finally declares himself. And this is what I, why I wanted you to look at 2 Thessalonians 2.4 is because a lot of people say, well, it was the standards the Romans put down. Or it was Antiochus Epiphanes with the statue of Jupiter. That's not what Paul said, is it? The abomination, the final abomination of desolation is a person who comes into the temple and declares himself basically to be Yahweh. That is not the Roman standard. That is not the, the statue of Jupiter. This is a guy who will rise up and he will say, all religions, everybody, you will bow to me. And all of them will except for one. And that's, that's the day when the true religion stands up with a backbone in it. There will be one religion that will say, no, no, we aren't carving out a spot for you. We have no other gods but Christ. And that will cost you. Now, and then it says this. It, it, it goes back into the extreme nature of it. It says, and if you are in the field, don't turn back to grab your your cloak. What that means is the Jews, what they did is because of the nature of their climate, they would start off the day very cool and they would have an extra cloak on them. And as they would begin working in the field, the, they would heat up and they would drop their cloak wherever they were and continue working. And at the end of the work day, they would go back and find wherever their cloak was to take it back home with them. He's saying, you ain't got time to get your coat. All right. It gets worse. He says, woe to those who are pregnant in those days and those who are nursing babies. Pray that your flight will not be in winter nor on a Sabbath. Now this passage, I think, turns it back to its context in history of 70 AD. Are you noticing that I'm bouncing back and forth between the two? It's not that I'm schizophrenic. I, I really do think that there sh it's a shadow of the great situation. When it's talking about your flight on a Sabbath, well, the, the, you could preserve your life and run if it was a Sabbath, even under the old law, you know, if it was your life is in danger. But this is not a concern that the modern Christian would have. I don't think, well, what am I? The thing is, is that in the area of Jerusalem, localized, to do anything on the Sabbath, you're hampered. Because you might be the only one who's running. And it might be okay for you to run. But as far as getting provisions, any of this type of stuff, a Sabbath, everything is totally shut down. The way it used to be like back in the 30s and the 40s in America. You know, you couldn't do nothing. I think that started changing around the 70s. You couldn't go get dinner on a Sunday, nothing like that. And also the idea here is that when evil overtakes suddenly... Those who are weak and frail are at a great disadvantage. And that's why it talks about women who are pregnant. I don't know, uh, Ruth, when you were pregnant, did you feel like running for your life? I don't think no, you didn't? You didn't feel like running from some wild, crazed dictator? Or how about to take care of a child? You know, people can find you. I remember a movie I enjoyed that was called Tears of the Sun, and there was a little baby that was crying while all the, the soldiers were coming, and, and they're needing this baby to not cry. The danger, what I'm trying to say is this. There's going to come a time, well, you know what, the next verse will actually explain it. This is, this is all I'm trying to say, and the next verse will actually explain it. It says, then there will be a great tribulation such as has never been seen from the beginning of the world until now or ever will be. Unless those days had been cut short, no one would have survived. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Okay? The magnitude of this is beyond, even though it was bad in Jerusalem in 70 AD, and next week we'll hit a passage that will prove everything I'm saying.
Trust me. Hang with me for next week. We will hit a verse here in a little bit that's going to prove that this is all future. And shadows of it were in 70 AD. Now this is how I'm going to apply this to right now. Because right now, I don't think we're enduring this right now, okay? I don't know. But here is how I would apply it to your life right now. The idea is when evil breaks forth. It's no joke. You don't want to play with it. Evil brings with it a vigorous, immediate, severe destruction. And when evil is starting to overtake something around you or in your family or your friends, you don't play around. You take whatever actions you've got to do with as much effort and with as much strength as you can, like a woman who is pregnant having to run for her life. You can say, well, I'm pregnant. I don't need to be running. Then you're going to die. That's how you got to treat evil. Evil's no joke. And when evil comes marching in in any form, you can't take it lightly, is what I'm saying. That is how we can apply this passage that really is about this really big thing that's going to happen in the future. That's how you apply it to right now. The same principle completely applies. Do not rest back when you see evil is on the march. Now, you turn to God to find out what is the appropriate action. Did you know that, notice here that God gave specific actions that he wanted them to take. In scripture, it tells you specific actions that you should take under certain scenarios when facing evil. Do not neglect to do those things. If you need to talk to your spouse and say, hey, uh, you've been whatever, and I'm worried about you because this isn't godly, don't be afraid. You've got to take action. Now, you've got to be wise. You don't just say, hey, I want to be here to be obnoxious to, to you for a while, and I'm going to obnoxious you into serving the Lord. That's not the approach. But the idea is you don't do nothing. Does that make sense to you guys? Let's go ahead and end there. 